In October, Waikato Regional Council's Chief Executive Vaughan Payne sent a letter to the Chief Executive of the Environmental Protection Authority, Rob Fulong, asking questions raised by councillors, including effects 1080 poison has on aquatic organisms, poison labelling compliance, and the removal of poison carcasses from forests and waterways. In his response to Vaughan Payne, Mr Forlong references studies undertaken by Niwa freshwater ecologist Dr Alistair Surin, stating, Results from both laboratory and controlled field studies have produced no evidence of adverse effects from exposure to toxic baits and aquatic species. In particular, studies on native fish and freshwater crayfish and aquatic macroinvertebrate communities indicated there were no adverse effects on these species from 1080 exposure. Dr Surin's work is often referenced by New Zealand authorities when justifying 1080 poison being eerily dropped directly into forest streams and waterways. In this video clip, scientist Dr Alistair Surin explains his experiments on effects of 1080 poison on freshwater animals. However, in his presentation, Dr Surin omits many important facts. Many people are concerned about what happens to 1080 when it falls in waterways and as a professional freshwater ecologist that's a concern I also have as well. About five years ago I obtained funding to actually research what happens when 1080 lands in water. Dr Surin was working under contract to the Animal Health Board. The Animal Health Board, now called Osprey, is the biggest user of 1080 poison in New Zealand. And I looked at three particular issues. Firstly, how much baits fall in streams and how long the 1080 stays in the baits for. Surin found up to 38 baits within 100 metre stretches of river. Baits remained intact and contained poison for over 24 hours in flowing water. Secondly, what happens to the small invertebrates and the fish that live in streams? Will they be affected by 1080? And thirdly, do freshwater crayfish eat 1080 baits? I did a study near Greymouth where I put a large number of baits up to about 60 in a small stream and I looked at the aquatic insects and fish above and below where I put the baits. I found after one day and four days no animals had died during the experiment. Some of the cages were stolen, many fish escaped and 15 upland bullies and okoro died after high rainfall. All this experiment showed was leech 1080 poison from baits did not kill caged fish that were 10 metres or 100 metres downstream. The study did not allow the fish to get close to or eat the baits, or eat the animals feeding on the baits. I also collected water samples which showed that 1080 was only noticeable or present in the water for 12 hours. So I decided to stop the experiment after four days because there was no more 1080 left. So this result showed that even with a lot of baits in a very small area in a very small stream, it didn't kill invertebrates or fish. Soren studied the effects of 1080 poison baits on invertebrates collected from rocks 10 metres and 100 metres downstream of mesh bags containing 1080 poison baits. Several significant effects of the poison were found. These included a decrease in the macroinvertebrate community index. The MCI is designed to detect pollution, which disrupts the natural community structure. The streams had been subjected to a short pulse, lasting up to 8 hours, of 0.2 micrograms per litre of 1080 poison. Surin found other significant effects in a previous study where declines in invertebrate numbers were seen following an aerial 1080 drop. But Surin claimed the significant effects he found were not ecologically significant rather than investigating further. In 2007, Irma undertook a review of 1080 poison use in New Zealand. A panel consisting of four members, the committee, was selected to make a decision on the continued use of the poison. A second group of researchers, the agency, were responsible for reviewing all scientific material and reporting to the committee with their findings. The Environmental Risk Management Authority's review of 1080, the year after Surin published his work, stated, There is significant uncertainty regarding the aquatic classification of 1080 due to the quality of the data available. Data gaps, toxicity to aquatic invertebrate species given the high toxicity to mosquito larvae. Apart from Surin's findings, Irma was faced with some concerning facts. Example, mosquito larvae were killed in 0.025 milligrams of 1080 poison per litre of water. The toxicity threshold for blue-green algae was 0.4 micrograms per litre. Three different species of duckweed proved sensitive, with frond multiplication rates being halved at concentrations of 0.5 millimoles of 1080. 
The thing about 1080, which a lot of people don't realise, is it's a natural chemical which plants produce to stop being eaten. If you're a plant, the last thing you want to do is be eaten by an animal. So 1080 is a natural anti-herbivore compound which is produced by plants to stop being eaten. Because it's natural, it's broken down in the environment by bacteria. Sun claims that 1080 is broken down in water. The EMA review showed that the chemicals produced from 1080 breakdown are largely unknown but include the highly toxic fluorocitrate. 1080 is a very toxic compound because in mammalian systems and many other animals and plants it is readily metabolized into a toxic isomer of fluorocitrate which interferes with a key biochemical pathway, the Krebs cycle. In a study with the aquatic plant Elodia canadensis, formation of fluorocitrate from 1080 in the water was observed. The agency was not able to locate any data on the aquatic toxicity of the metabolite fluorocitrate. One millimole of 1080 caused an accumulation of citrate and altered the lipid composition in cells. It also inhibited nitrogen fixation markedly in aerobic conditions. There are no data as to whether the metabolic compounds are fluorocitrate or glycolate or any other potential product of metabolism. Data gaps, biodegradation in aquatic systems. The last study I did looked at freshwater crayfish and I wanted to see whether firstly they ate 1080 baits or secondly whether they died if they did eat 1080 baits. I did this work in a simulated stream where I placed crayfish in small cages and I fed them a mixture of their natural food and I put one 1080 bait in each cage. We found that the crayfish did eat the baits and that doesn't surprise me because a lot of crayfish growers actually feed their crayfish pellets in a similar way that 1080 is a pellet. Surin's caged freshwater crayfish were each given a 1080 bait. They shifted the bait close to or into their shelters and ate some or all of it. Surin found that his poisoned crayfish did not die within eight days. Three quarters of Surin's crayfish were killed and analysed within four days of the 1080 bait being presented. The remaining poisoned crays were killed on day eight for analysis. However, 1080 may take much longer than eight days to kill crayfish. Some species take a very long time to die from 1080 poisoning. For example, 1080 poisoned lizards took up to 21 days to die. We also found that the crayfish took the 1080 up into their bodies and their bodies had traces of 1080 in it, in the tail muscle and the viscera. Significant amounts of 1080 were found in tails from killed crayfish from days one to eight. The highest amount of 1080 was found in the tail of a large individual four days after being fed the bait. A freshwater crayfish may be able to find up to seven poison baits within its home range, so may eat far more poison than in Surin's study. 1080 was still detectable in the water flume used by Surin until five days after the single baits were added. Irma found if a child consumed 200 grams of contaminated crayfish, an unacceptable risk level might be possible. The risk from meat consumption for freshwater species may be higher than for terrestrial meat sources. The agency considers this conclusion misleading. A prime aim of 1080 operations is to avoid deposition of baits into waterways. However, these amounts were very, very small and the crayfish excreted the 1080 after a few days. The crayfish were fed one small 6 gram bait each. Baits used in most aerial drops are 12 grams, twice the size and the amount of poison that were fed to Surin's crays. Most animals, if they consume sublethal amounts of 1080, will excrete the 1080 so that after a few days there will be no 1080 left in the animal. The Irma review showed that 1080 does not simply pass harmlessly through animals' bodies. Example, one metabolic product of 1080 was an amino acid. It is possible that a fluorinated amino acid may be incorporated into proteins. As would be expected, a proportion of the fluoride release from 1080 metabolism is retained in bone. 1080 can cause reproductive toxicity in male mammalian species. 1080 can cause developmental effects in laboratory rodents. The chronic administration of this low level caused an early but temporary retardation of growth, a termination of the experiment. The testes showed severe damage characterized by massive disorganization of the tubules, nearly total loss of functional cells, absence of sperm and damage to the Sotoli cells. The Irma review showed that 1080 has an incredible ability to spread and to contaminate. 1080 is relatively soluble, so the likelihood of drinking water residues is relatively high. If a major spill into a waterway occurred, the spread may be uncontrollable. 
since 1080 is highly water soluble, the agency assumes that it would be difficult to remove by treatment processes. The applicants clarified that the breakdown of 1080 in the aquatic environment would be better described as dilution. The very low concentrations of 1080 which may occur in the environment may be too low to favour microbial degradation or induce the necessary enzyme systems. Despite all the limitations and results of his experiments, Surin makes some outlandish claims. So our sh results of all studies show that although 1080 baits do land in streams, the 1080 leaches out from the baits very, very quickly. Because it's a natural product, it is broken down by bacteria. It does not affect fish, it does not infect, affect aquatic invertebrates, and it does not affect freshwater crayfish. Additional concerns, chronic poisoning. Irma identified poison carcasses as an ongoing risk. 1080 residues are persistent in animal carcasses for prolonged periods in winter conditions. The agency understands that carcasses can reach waterways, particularly after significant rain events, and agrees there are some aspects which makes this a higher risk in relation to drinking water contamination. In particular, a single carcass could contain a number of baits, and the drinking water source may have already been declared free of contamination. Data gaps, chronic aquatic toxicity data. Additional concerns, invalid 1080 test results. The IRMA review revealed that 1080 levels may have been consistently underreported. Loss of 1080 from soil stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius was identified in a Landcare report. The agency sought clarification from Landcare research. Their response highlights the uncertainty around the loss of 1080 from stored samples and suggests that concentrations of 1080 in such samples may have been underreported. The accuracy of results from other laboratories may be similarly uncertain, with details of sample collection and storage similarly absent from the published literature. There may be some uncertainty associated with drinking water results when sampling storage information is taken into account. Eason refers to water samples being frozen within five hours of collection. This seems a relatively long time before appropriate storage of the sample was carried out but it reflects the reality of sampling remote water sources and traversing the area on foot. Incredibly, despite these shortcomings, the agency compared both the acute and the chronic exposures that could occur from aerial 1080 operations based on the water sampling data that had been reported. The New Zealand Poison Manufacturer's warning label states, take measures to minimize the chance of baits accidentally entering any body of water and harmful to aquatic organisms. However, in New Zealand, the contractors are permitted to airily spread the poison directly across the pristine mountain streams. At the current application rates, 249 cereal baits are cast across every hectare of forest and dropped directly into the water where trout and other aquatic wildlife search tirelessly for their next feed. This flight chart of a recent poison drop shows that no streams within the boundaries were avoided. This graphic shows a typical New Zealand forest stream network. By investigating what was happening in water, we discovered that 1080, the poison itself, is it's uptaken. This happens in the water, any dead leaves, uh, any vegetation, uh, the animal life itself, any small animal life there too, also takes up the 1080. The animal life, of course, is, is, is often killed. It's taken up by these plants, by the kura, by the mayfly that was under a rock just there. Any of the animal life, whether it be trout or whatever, that's where your 1080 remains while they tell you that your waterway is completely clear. <laughs>